That is the Porsche, wait a minute. This is the beautiful Tenerife in the Canary Islands, and that is the new Porsche 911 Carrera. That is the new Porsche 911 Carrera S, and yes, it looks a lot like the last Porsche 911 Carrera S. But it's not. This is the 2017 Carrera S, codenamed 991.2 if you follow Porsche's body codes. And you may have heard it has the most significant engine update since the very first water-cooled 911. Displacement's getting smaller, and number of turbochargers is going from zero to two. Yes, there are snails in the garden, and some people may think that's like turbocharging a Brazilian supermodel, or a Hershey bar, or London Calling, but is it really messing with perfection? Is what I would ask if I were a complete dick. The truth is, the 911 Carrera is still such an important sports car that every time they change something, you kind of hold your breath. You think, is this when Porsche finally snuffs out the magic so they don't scare away all the dentists? The car we're driving today has a seven-speed manual transmission. You can still get one of those. Yes, good for you. It's also painted in Miami blue, Porsche's new take on an old Volkswagen color from the 70s. It does photograph beautifully up against the lava fields of Mount Tede, the volcanic epicenter of Tenerife, one of the Canary Islands. That's a Spanish tax haven off the coast of Morocco where Porsche held the 911 launch. The last time Tede erupted was in 1909, but this giant slumbering beast just won't sit still. You can tell because the roads up here are spectacular, but the pavement can be corrugated and a bit lumpy. And that's okay because the new Carrera's active suspension tune is more compliant in the softest setting and a little stiffer in the stiffest setting. We kept the dampers in normal because I think they're just about perfect that way. We should mention Porsche's active chassis now comes standard on all Carreras. It's also got more tire. The S has these massive 305s in the rear, and so saying this is the most firmly planted Carrera ever with the best body control calibration in 911 history is tempered only by the fact that you can still buy more stuff, like the even lower PASM Sport and those counter-actuated PDCC anti-sway bars, stuff that could make it even better. I really like the influence of the 918 on this car. Yes, the steering wheel is almost right out of the 918, and this new radial mode selector also right out of the 918 it takes away some of that viral proliferation of buttons here. I know you want to talk about that new engine, but let's enjoy the manual transmission for another minute because who knows when it'll go away. This one has a new twin disc clutch to handle the torque load. The pedal is light and feathery, but easy to modulate. It's like stepping on an angel's wing in ballet slippers. But on roads like these, you'll just be keeping it in third gear anyway. In fact, from third gear on, the ratios are progressively taller than in the previous Carrera. Nerd point, they're the same ratios as the Turbo S, only with a shorter final drive. Of course, because we didn't drive a car with PDK, we didn't get the electronic differential, an excellent piece of machinery, and we also didn't get rear steer, which is now an option on the Carrera S. Those two items are important to mention because they give you two opposing traits at once, like you can have an open diff for stability and a locker in mid-corner, and you can have a long wheelbase on the highway and an effectively shorter one on a mountain road. That's all part of the plan to keep widening the 911's dynamic range so it appeals to more buyers. To Porsche, the 911 has always been the aspirational sports car, the one that you save to own, the one that you buy when you've made it. And so it's important to keep adapting the 911 to the needs of a wider audience, of dentists. Okay, I'm kidding. My dentist drives a Ford Fusion. But it all means this new Carrera S now has as much in common with an old air-cooled Porsche 911 as a P51 Mustang has with a joint strike fighter. And it costs only slightly less than an F35. The new Carrera S now starts at about 100 grand. So let's talk elephant in the room. The engine, that thing that's always given the 911 most of its character as a sports car. I know this is hard to follow, but decades ago, Porsche started turbocharging its flat six. Subsequently, it won Le Mans overall in 1979, and since then, the Porsche 911 Turbo has been the top of the line for all 911s. 
So when we talk about a turbocharged Carrera versus a turbocharged 911 Turbo, this is not the same engine. In fact, there are a lot of things about this engine that are completely different than the 911 Turbo engine, which we might call the big block, I guess, at this point. 3.8 liters compared to three liters for this one. When was the last time a Porsche 911 engine was three liters? So this engine has a higher compression ratio. Also, having hit a hard stop at four liters, they kind of had to go to turbocharging to get specific power output up to the point where we are now, which is 370 horsepower for the base model, 420 for the S. Now for a three liter, that's actually pretty damn good. But if you thought the combination of small displacement, small turbos, and a comparatively longer stroke boxer would make this a stump-pulling torque monster of head-snapping proportion, you'd be mistaken. You can tell the engineers wanted to keep the traditional 911 feel and character, only with a power band compressed into a shorter rev span. Power builds all the way to its peak at 6,500 RPM, but revving a thousand more still feels natural, a testament to lower friction internals. The Carrera S engine gets different pistons, larger turbo compressor wheels, and a more aggressive ECU tune. We've been hearing that this car has a tabletop flat torque curve from 1700 RPM. I have no reason to doubt Porsche's figures, but this engine really wakes up at 3300 RPM. So maybe with the turbos you compromise a bit on sound, but on the inside you get a more guttural growl now. Could be because they put a second mechanical resonator behind the seats, which amplifies induction pulses. They call it the sound symposer. Interior volume seems a bit less dramatic overall, but it's still toothy enough and probably will be less mind scrambling on long Autobahn rides. Still, get the sport exhaust, you won't be disappointed. For a lot of luxury car makers, their infotainment systems have not been as good as some cheaper car makers, and so a lot of these technologies have had to trickle up, and that's exactly what's happened here with the new 911. This is the best nav system that this car has ever had. It's, not, it's the kind of thing where you don't have to go back and unlearn things to use it. It has swiping, and it's, it's hooked up to Google, and you can, what do you call that when you go like this? <laughs> what's this called? Pinching. So you can pinch and swipe. So bottom line, the new 911 is an incremental change for the better from the previous one, despite a whole new engine philosophy and upgrades in suspension to it. It's kind of a low-key revolution. Buyers in China won't have to pay the big import tax on cars over three liters anymore, and the 911 just keeps on its march toward becoming the sports car for every occasion. Yeah, the Porsche 911, still one of the best sports cars and still a lot of value for the money, even though it's still a lot of money. And if I were a real tone-deaf idiot, I might say something like this. The Porsche 911 991.2. Can a sports car be both revolutionary and evolutionary at the same time? I think it can. <laughs>